What about limited English proficiency? English is a second language. We have students we involved have, in that as well. Yeah, I think we have close to 70. Um, How is their integration? That must be a, a, a bigger challenge in a sense. Uh, I think it probably depends on the student. I mean, I know we've got good support. We could, you know, I, I think we're adding a little more support, but um, I think by and large, we do a pretty good job with our program. Is there a statewide initiative on that that, that we're factoring into? Uh, I know there is a statewide element to it. I'm not sure exactly how the mechanics Which works. brings us straight to special needs. What's yeah. going on with special needs these days that's different than in the past? Uh, yeah, the, the state has passed a new law um, that basically allows for more flexible spending around special needs. Um, you know, that's going to start to affect us in the next few years. Uh, and the what does that mean? That, that, I was listening to it and it sounded like jargon. In practical terms, what does that mean? I think in practical terms it means that um, that resources had to be slotted in very specific ways. So we get more flexibility. So we get more flexibility to, for instance, if, um, you know, say there's a, and this might be an imperfect example, a special needs instructor in a classroom um, that's giving instruction that could be valuable to a student who like doesn't qualify for an IEP but might be on a, a 504. Um, what is a 504? What is well, an IEP? An IEP is a, an individualized education plan, which is for... Doesn't every student have one of those? Those are personalized learning plans. Oh, okay. Okay, which is different. This is for students who are at a certain level of um, a performance that, that indicates that they need true, true intervention and true special help. A, a 504 plan is for a student who has shown a learning disability um, but is still performing at a level where they, at a level high enough where they don't qualify for an IEP. So, uh, you know, with, with really slotted spending, you could have an instructor who is providing instruction for a student on an IEP, which, is, which qualifies for, you know, certain federal aid uh, and state aid um, that could benefit a student who it does not qualify for an IEP, right. but could really benefit from that instruction in a way that, that wouldn't at all detract from the instruction given to the student on the IEP. You know, right now there's a lot of circumstances where that instructor is not able to give instruction to that second child. So, so by increasing flexibility, we could find situations like that where we could meet more needs with a similar expenditure of resources. While we're dealing with IEPs, let's return back to the achievement gap for yep. students on free and subsidized food, yes. food stamps and the like. Uh, that gap has been persistent for, yep. for decades. This board has said we want to say time out, we want to take a new look at this. What is a new look? Well, I think mostly um, we've really asked Libby to, to look at ways to do that by you know, tightening systems at the schools by giving support that we need to, you know, to help those students uh, access their education and, and achieve at the levels we want them to achieve. Um, yeah, I think Libby's done a really good job of, of kind of working within the schools, working with teachers to, to tighten those systems. Um, and we've started to make you know, more investments in literacy coaches, math coaches, uh, you know, special education providers, uh, and I think deploy them a little more strategically to start to you know, give those students the support that they need to, to reach a level of achievement that, that uh, is gonna allow them to, to succeed in life. When we talked a while back about Matt McLean and his community-based yep. learning, there's a role for our community on the other side of that, you know, yes. providing opportunities for yep. the youth. Is there a role for the community at large in terms of helping the achievement of these students? Is Libby writing in a role we have the in-school people who are being redeployed is is the school board thinking about a role for the community to volunteer and, and actually lend a hand in boosting this well I think certainly um, you know you know community members do great things like participate in the community-based learning program um, 
you know, those opportunities are being accessed by all students and, you know. Right. You know, so, you know. But this particular group, have, is Libby connected with the Kellogg Hubbard Library, Children's Library, you know, to bring in beyond Union Elementary, to give them that strong foundation where it's less needed as you go up the ladder? I mean, I think she definitely is having those conversations, um, you know, how specifically, but I, I think you're right, there is, I think it's even, you know, to be totally honest, I think there's only so much any school district can do to totally achieve. Right. To close the achievement gap. Which it's, is it's why you sit program. and which is why you <coughs> sit and go to the out, outer community. Yeah. And, well, for help. Yeah, and it's not just the outer community, but um, you know, it's it's the state house, it's Congress, it's you know, there's you know, when when you have families in crisis that that don't have health care, that that have major addiction problems. Um, you know that are are struggling to pay the rent that are under incredible But that almost stress. sounds like why try it all? You know? Well, because <laughs> I think there is a lot to school. I mean the school has a role um, and the school needs to do all it can do But I think it's naive to think that Is there the a metric of success where you know Libby is doing well? You know in terms of closing if that gap is never likely never mm -hmm. to close which I think is realistic How do you know that we're having an impact? Uh, I, th I think, I think you're right that without um, a full societal effort, that getting that gap to close completely is is unrealistic. A, probably a pie in the sky goal. I, I think we can. I, I think the school can play a role in closing it somewhat. Um, and I think when we start to see that gap narrow, um, we'll we'll know we're we're at least the district is doing its part. And I think the the, you know, the district always needs to strive to do more on that, but I I think there's I think the district alone could could narrow that gap. Um, and you, and the board is watching that metric. Yeah, we we definitely are watching that metric. You I had mean, spoken of that before yeah. that that you asked for segmented information. Yeah, no, we have definitely asked for you know the type of information that lets us know how um, you know various subgroups are doing, and uh, you know Libby is a data driven person, so. I'm going to ask you about a couple of projects that yes. are being discussed. Yep. Um, a language track, language immersion track in the elementary school. Yep. Where is that project right now? What's the timeline on that that the public can expect uh, a more detailed conversation on that? First of all, what is it? So it's it would basically be a program that would provide. Uh, that basically would, would turn one of the five kindergarten classes into a full language immersion class. In what language? Uh, that would have to be determined. It would most likely be Spanish or French um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but basically it would, it would be kindergarten in that language in a in a world language and likely Spanish. and when the child graduates from kindergarten what happens uh, they continue that class stays as a, a cohort um, and they continue up through you know the elementary grades what happens when there's attrition and you fall beneath the level of the other classes because you can't bring in kids in third grade who haven't had that preparation in kindergarten first and second yeah no you wouldn't again that cohort would stay uh, together there's um, yeah the programs that have the schools that are doing that program now uh, really put a significant amount of vetting to make sure that you know the children and the families of those kids are know what they're getting into and are committed to it so we were coming back circular on the, yeah. the kids who are on food stamps whose parents wouldn't vet well for that program. Could this be an, I upper, think th could this be an upper middle class cohort? I, th I think they could vet well. I mean, essentially it's um, one knowing you're, you're in it. Uh, and then, you know, basically the, it's, it's not something that's favored for, for kids who have, you know, reading or language disabilities. Um, so but, we're getting into the question again, yeah. is this an upper middle class cohort because kids who are of lower income families are more likely to have academic problems in reading and math? Um, 
My understanding is that, you know, again, and we'd have to listen to the study committee, so I don't want to speak before, but it would be designed to ensure that there is a proportional number of students um, from free and reduced lunch slots and that, you know, there's an effort made to ensure those are all filled. How do we know that this is successful, this project? Because uh, other students, other schools have done it, and it's been it's been very successful in, in teaching kids language. Um, actually, the the test scores of some of the students tend to be quite high um, because <laughs> again, you know, if it's an upper middle class program, you would think they'd be high. What if a student? But but it's gets, not even with. Even what if a kid is from a lower income family gets into this? Yep and has academic problems, are they dropped out of this program if, if they test poorly? Uh, I think they're given the support that they otherwise would be given. I mean, the idea is that you're, this is, this is not a language class. This is kindergarten, this is first grade, this is second grade, this is third grade. It just happens there, to be. Right, but there is a, a learning component in, in reading and math, a strong learning yes. component. If they're not able to grasp that learning component, reading in English, yeah. in a Spanish class, would they be dropped from the class? I don't know. Again, this, okay. we're, we're in a study. I'm just curious. Well, we're in a study committee, and yeah. You know, when will the community? When do we think we'll implement this? Well, again, it, at, it's at a study level. So what we've okay. committed to is a study. They will come out with a report that'll answer, I think, a lot of the questions you're yeah. asking. Um, I'm, what I'm speaking to is the experience that I've heard from other schools. Uh, and then we'll decide whether it's a good fit for us. Could this be something that will roll out in the fall? Or are we talking about a year it, from the it, fall? It's not going to happen in the fall. Okay. It, it, would, it would have to be in the budget, and we'd have to have plans for it for the fall. The earliest it would happen would be 2021, 2022. What are the fiscal implications of this? How many new teachers do we anticipate hiring? Uh, or we don't know? We don't know. Okay. Um, I think the idea is that it would be you'd have the same amount of teachers, but you'd have to hire... A different set a different of skills. Set of, yeah. You do basically be hiring not a Spanish teacher, but a kindergarten teacher who could teach kindergarten in Spanish. Can we find one? <laughs> huh? Well, that's you why I use a language like Spanish or French, because if you're teaching it in, you know, you know Romanian or something, right, right. Your, your, pool, your, your pool gets pretty small. Um, Main Street Middle School, there's yes. talk about that. Yes. What is the talk on Main Street Middle School? What's going on on that issue? So we've put together a study committee to really look at the future of that building and what we want to do with it. And, and there's no predetermined outcome. Uh, as you know, that's, that's an older building. Uh, it's a building that can be expensive to run because it is an older building. Uh, some of it's A building we've poured a lot of money exactly. into in the last decades. Yeah, so really taking a look back and saying, you know, what do we want to do? We want to keep it as is, maybe do a better job of keeping a fund for maintenance so we can keep on top of it a little Are better. Are we talking about another middle school? And do we have enough students in the pipeline to support another middle school? Uh, it, I, I certainly think that they, one of the possibilities they might look at is, at least theoretically, is you know, do we construct another middle school? Um, do we do a, a renovation of that school that would be, that would keep the facade, keep the bones, but maybe bring some of the systems up to date in a way that you know would be pretty comprehensive. Assuming we did that, yes. What are the implications long term of of U32 Washington Central when they pull their, themselves together and Montpelier sending students back and forth as as was discussed in the past, so that those middle school students would go to Montpelier High School along with the middle school portion yeah. of U32, and the high school students would go to U32. We'd have much more critical mass at the high school level for offering more course offerings. If we were to invest that heavily in that building, wouldn't that foreclose that forever? Um, I, I don't, I, first answer is no, I don't think so. The second answer is I actually think it might be beneficial for that, and here's why. Because if you look at, if, you, if, if we've merged those two districts, and, and this is a very Way hypothetical. Very hypothetical conversation. Um, and you're looking for efficiencies in terms of, of buildings. That's like the third or fourth largest building we have. So you, you, you merge the districts, you've got, you've got you know, three or four really tiny schools. 
Um, so does that have to be a middle school? No, it could be, say, a second elementary school. So maybe you do something where some East Montpelier kids and some Montpelier kids go to that as an elementary school. And instead of closing... Well, you talk about the thorniness, try and, you, and close one of those small elementary schools, which brings us to well, Roxbury. Well, what, what would you do? I mean, if, if you're merging on the idea of efficiency of scale, do you close one of your largest buildings or do you close the small expensive ones? Are we going to close Roxbury? Huh? There is no plans to close Roxbury. Is that an efficient run school? Is that, is that 40 kids in that school with the number of teachers, is that an efficient operation? Yeah, right now it is certainly not our most efficient school. I think- Is it our least efficient school? It is, I, I think per pupil it is our least efficient school. I think that's fair to say. What is the rationale besides it makes the community feel better about itself for keeping that school open and not just sending those kids to Union Elementary? Well, I mean, there's a few. For one, I'm not sure there's, there's room at Union Elementary for them. Uh, two, it's, it's important to that community. Um, it's a good school, and it's, it's a good anchor of that community. Uh, we did make a promise to Roxbury that that would be open. And we made a promise that it would be open for a certain number of yes, years. Yes, yes. And I think, um, you know, I think one of the conversations going forward will be how can we make that school more efficient? I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic building. Um, so how can we make it more efficient and how can we satisfy the needs of the Roxbury community? I think there are creative ways to do that. There's, now, there's, I've heard rumblings that that conceivably, because it's a good yeah. facility, it's, it's a, in yeah. some ways a better school than Union yep. facility-wise. I'd heard rumblings of a magnet school. I think that's certainly on the table. I mean, could we now do Now explain something? what a magnet school is. Well, it would be a school that would have, um, you know, a, a particular theme. Uh, for instance, um, and this is, again, purely hypothetical, uh, we could kind of model it after some, some outdoor, uh, you know, modes of education where, you know, we have a more kind of nature-based, interactive-based uh, education philosophy. Uh, that you know appeals to I think a lot of parents in this community, and that could be a place where where children from both communities could go. So that would uh, you know increase the number of students who are using that school, uh, make it a model for you know perhaps other districts, and you know potentially give a place uh, where we're actually losing students, and when we lose students, it it hurts our our tax base. Uh, you know, the type of students who might be inclined, or parents who might be inclined to send their kids to Waldorf might be very attracted by, So you that know, discussion is actually in the background at least being considered. Yeah, they're, I think tackling the, the issue of how to make Roxbury a, a stellar school. I mean, it's a, it's a good school now. I think it could be I think it could be a special school. Will that issue actually surface? Or I will we that, simply say, hey, we promised you you'd be around and you're going to be around forever? Will that, I think will that there issue, be an issue? I think that issue will surface. I, I think that, um, yeah, uh, I think we have an administration that's committed to excellence and not ignoring things. Um, and I think there are ways to make that school a, a special school that works financially. Um, and I, I, I don't think that will be ignored. I think that conversation okay. will occur. Um, class sizes at Montpelier High School. Yes. Uh, that was on the agenda again this year. It's on the agenda yeah. every year. What's, what's the current status of that and the current thinking? And uh, keeping in mind that some of those small classes are absolutely necessary yeah. for uh, advanced placement purposes, for making your schedule mesh if you're trying to get into a better college and the like. Yeah, you know, really, the, I, I think the, the apex of that conversation was a few years ago when enrollment at, at Montpelier High School was significantly less than it is now. Um, there are very few classes right now that still have... A handful. A handful. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think as long as, you know, enrollment continues to be where it is right now, when you know Libby rolls out the you know the class size list, there's there's not a lot of classes you can point to and say, wow, that's really tiny. Um, what about state house? What are you tracking in the state house? What kinds of bills are, are there right now that the board has on their radar? Besides the question of needs based financing in the school, where districts that have mm -hmm. more poor kids 
would have a different cut of the formula to account yeah. for the fact that there's more poor kids. Is there anything else at the, at the state level that you guys are watching? Um, yeah, I probably should have more of an eye on the state house in this session than I do, but there's, you know, there haven't been a lot of huge rumblings. Obviously, we're very interested in, you know, the health care and other things, but... Um, what about that notion of, you know, if you have more poor kids, then your district would get a better cut in the formula. If you have fewer, then your district would not would get a worse cut because it's a you know, it's a limited pie. I mean, I think there's a lot of merit to that idea. Um, would it hurt us? I mean, I, we're at twenty percent at Union Elementary. Um, I have not run the numbers, but we are certainly a district that has. Uh, you know, fewer, fewer and reduced lunch kids than a lot of other districts. Uh, you know, that said, that, um, you know, the educational needs of, um, you know, kids that are, are not performing at certain levels is higher. And to really close the gap, it, it takes resources. So, uh, you know, if... I mean, that's if, a fight that, that will be going for a few sessions. That's, yeah. that's not going to resolve yeah. this year. Um, and then two more questions, I'll let yeah. you go. I realize you're getting tortured by this because you're the board president yes. and because you're the only serious, real incumbent that's running again. So it's difficult to get this background history from other people who have other strengths they're yeah. bringing to the board, but not the institutional yep. history. Uh, what's flexible pathways that, that uh, community-based learning is talking about? Uh, flexible pathways is, um, and Matt McLean could explain a lot better than I can, uh, you know, it's the idea that there's kind of different ways to, 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 learn, skills. to learn different skills. Uh, and, um, you know, really being, uh, I think, attuned to the fact that, that uh, you know, if you're taking an apprenticeship at, you know, Bear Pond or something, um, you know, thinking about the skills that you're really learning, that, you know, learning persistence and grit and, um, interaction with, you know, kind of the interpersonal the skills of being in public and, you know, interacting with someone in a, a business setting where it's different than with a, a cohort of peers. So, you know, thinking about different ways to, to get skills. rather. What's than the big challenge coming up that, that the board isn't facing right now? <coughs> is there anything that is looming on the horizon that you can see that, that's an emerging issue? Um, yeah, I, I think you touched on it. I think, you know, kind of the future of a couple of our buildings are, um, you know, there's nothing urgent there, but I think we want to be thoughtful about, about well, that. Well, I believe it was last budget. It might be wrong. It might be two budgets ago. You put together the revolving um, capital fund. Yes. Was that the last budget? Yes, and we have we have that on again. And the idea there is really, I think, to, uh, you know, to not get to have a situation. Have to go to, to the bonding, to the major bonding. Exactly. And uh, the final question, the mudlot. What yes. is the mudlot and what is its fate? So the mudlot is um, what has been kind of a de facto parking area uh, on the side of the high school by Smiley Auditorium where they put Circus Smirkus in that area. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's an eyesore. It's likely a source of pollution to the river. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to eventually turn that into, like, recapture it as green space. What will happen to that parking that's there? Uh, you obviously have a demand for parking, otherwise it wouldn't be there. It wouldn't be a spillover. I, I think we're going to figure out other ways to, to get parking. And, you know, I think as a city as a whole, we... You know, there's, you know, for big events, if the parking garage goes in, um, you know, that'll serve. Uh, it's not that far of a walk. Um, it's really only spillover events. And, and, you know, I think, you know, it might encourage some people to, you know, bike to a, a spring or fall or summertime event when they might drive. Um, uh, now I'm going to we'll hit you with a hard one. Uh, since we last talked a year ago, you know, last school year. Yep. Um, any major teacher retirements for those of us who um, live in town and, yeah. and had kids in the schools? 
Well, Pam Arnold is retiring. Um, Pam Arnold being? Pam Arnold, the principal of, of Main Street Middle School, and she's been there for 14 years and I think has really, um, you know, done a lot to lead that school. Uh, and we to lost a, a good principal place. At, at Montpelier High School. Yes, we, Mike McCraith uh, left last summer and he obviously was fantastic and did a great job of, of leading that school and, and, you know, with the Black Lives Matter flag. Uh, you know, gaining some national recognition for his leadership. Uh, yeah, and we have a fantastic new principal at, at Montpelier High School, Renee Devore. Who is that? Renee Devore, um, and she comes from Illinois, but she's, she's fantastic, and, and she's, I think, doing a really good job of, of picking up uh, where Mike Any other uh, central office hires in the last year? Uh, we actually have, we will be seeing three new ones. Oh, we picked up, um, didn't we pick up a print? No, we, our principal at um, Union was there last year. He was there last year. Okay, any central office hires? Um, we obviously have to, we're hiring to replace Pam, and uh, Monday the two final candidates will be coming in uh, for a long day of interviews. Uh, we're going to be hiring a new uh, principal for the Roxbury Village School, and we really anticipate that that principal would be part of the conversation about how to take that school to the, the next know, level. The next, yeah, the next level. Um, and Mary Lundeen, who uh, has been the, the uh, special education director uh, for the last several years and has really done a fantastic job of, of uh, meeting the needs of kids. And um, she's, a, she's a fantastic manager. Uh, she came in, I think, immediately solved a uh, number of thorny issues. A number of thorny issues, um, and uh, you know, saved the district a lot just in terms of of being efficient and um, you know, f finding the right grants and uh, making sure. That What's happening with her? She is uh, going to Chittenden County. She lives in Chittenden County. She found another special education director position where she does not have to commute. Um, so, uh, you know, unfortunately we're losing her, but, but we'll be replacing her. So she's a soul in that's sailing on. <laughs> yes. Jim, I want to thank you for your time. Again, uh, this you. has been an extremely long show simply because this is the state of the school district yeah. right now in a sense. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you. And I appreciate you watching this show. And I hope, as I said at the beginning, that you'll watch the other shows, watch the candidates, not only for the city, but the school candidates. All the school candidates will be here. Watch Libby's discussion of the budget as well as Jim's discussion, or I'm sorry, Bill's discussion of the city budget. And thank you so very much for watching. One final point, please do get out and vote on town meeting day. It's extremely important. Civic engagement is what makes us a community. So thank you much for watching. Have a good evening.